Hey everybody, welcome back to Making Waves Podcast. Today, I think it's going to be a good one. I am speaking with Peter Lambden. Now, Peter, I think, is a, is a renaissance man. Peter is a celebrity hairstylist working out of the Chris McMillan Salon in California. He is a triathlete. He's a surfer. What else are you, Pete? Peter is a collector and mechanic of vintage motorcycles and my personal favorite, Porsches. In this conversation, Peter is going to discuss what it was like to go from the music industry to choose a career as a hairstylist, what it's like to work with Chris McMillan, and what are the Kardashians like during a haircut, and the Jenners. It's all, it's all in there. We're going to talk about Porsches. We're going to talk about how Peter uses media and social media to further his career. First, I want to thank our sponsors, iconic clothing brand Bridges Great Outdoors and Jesse Itzler's 30 Days of Excellence, a part of the BYLR program. So now that we got all that out of the way, I hope you enjoy my conversation with Peter Landon. Thank you for coming to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Uh, we start every one, as you know, with a rapid fire series of questions. This gives us a kind of a rough idea who we're going to be dealing with for the next couple minutes, you know? Yeah. Get to know you a little bit just with these 10 questions. Absolutely. All right. So dogs or cats? Dogs. Hands down. Um, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Rolling Stones or Beatles? This is the one that everybody gets stuck on, and I think it's the unpopular decision, but I instinctively say Beatles. Okay. How is that unpopular, though? I, every podcast series I've listened to, people have they're, they're really one leg on either side of the fence on that topic, and yeah. you know the Stones are incredible, but they make rock and roll, and the Beatles make rock and roll and everything else. Yeah. You know? You can always find a Beatles song for the mood you want to feel and the mood you're in. The Stones, as amazing as they are, you know what you're going to get with each song from the Stones. Yeah. You know, I, I have yet to answer all these uh, questions on, on yeah. the And this is one I get all the time when we finish podcasts. I'm like, well, okay, what are your answers on that? And I'm like, I'm a Stones guy. Like, I love the Beatles. They're, they're, they are they have a little pocket in my life right there, a little speed. Mm -hmm. But to me, I think I've said this on a podcast before. My favorite thing about the Rolling Stones is Keith Richards. And he's just got yeah, hands he, down. He fits in a pocket. And my uber favorite thing about the Stones is his background vocals. It's not in pitch. It's not perfect singing. He doesn't have the yeah. great American Idol voice in the world but it is perfect for the Rolling Stones, you know? There's a lot of, you know, I'm not like the the music nerd that I know some of your guests are. I lack that like in-depth knowledge, but I have a very close friend who is like a musical genius guitar wizard and has industry connections all around. So I know there's a lot of stories around different Stones songs and the like really unique and unorthodox ways they've gotten and done backup vocals. Yeah. You know, there's like that famous story, like the woman who's like dragged out of her house in the middle of the night to come and do, you know, backup vocals on Gimme Shelter. And it's like, you know, I, I've heard a few others along that lines. And I, I know it's a real like part of the Stones aura that people key into is. Well, when I when I go to Sunset Sound, that's one of the things I'm going to do. I'm going to cover all the Van Halen stuff that I want to talk about, but. I want to like they keep track sometimes a lot of times if they had a good engineer of like microphone placements and what yeah. microphones they used and I want to know how I want to do a little research on those background vocals of the Stones. I just For sure. love them. Love them, love them. All right, uh if you drink soda, Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Coke. Uh beat This is going to be tough for you I think. Beach or mountains? I've been preparing. You know what? I I happen to live in the best place in the world where the mountains meet the beach and I get to experience them both interchangeably. And I could never imagine giving up one for the other. Okay. I'll let you slide on that one. <laughs> it's one of my favorite parts, favorite little pieces of landscape in the world where you live. I mean, gun to my head beach. Okay. Uh, PC or Mac Mac East, I, East coast or West coast. Stuff. West Coast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kramer or Costanza? I've never really watched a full episode of Seinfeld in my life. Wow. Homer, Sim Homer Simpson. Let's go home. That is an excellent answer. Uh, Superman or Batman? Batman. 
Kardashians or Osbournes? Kardashians live in your backyard, don't they? Kardashians, yeah. 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 You ever did any Kardashian hair? I've done some Kardashian hair. Yeah, I think if you're I think if you're a hairdresser in Los Angeles for long enough, you end up <laughs> doing some Kardashian hair. When they require so much of it. Hair, does it like shoot electricity through your body? Like do you get some special surge of Kardashian aura? <laughs> you know what? I think the I've worked with a few different Kardashians um, and Jenners. And you know, I think the, the biggest thing that people are shocked with is like how just incredibly professional and like easy the process is. They, you know, getting hair done is like part of daily life for them. And, you know, production and being on camera and all that. And so you think it's going to be this like really big thing and there's going to be like, you know, go through the secret tunnel and you pop out in there like but it's like no like they they get they get this done day in and day out it's their job and they make it seamless yeah they're I some see. of the most professional people i've worked with i hear that a lot yeah all right pete peter i'm gonna go with peter i'm, I'm into that right. i want to go pete but i'll go Peter. maybe on the second one you know it's a little more casual <laughs> <laughs> your business name uh all right so listen you crossed my instagram radar because to me you're like the quintessential renaissance man right to me and in my opinion you're a hair hairstylist i love the dichotomy right hairstylist surfer triathlete and like mechanic on your own classic cars and bikes motorcycles is that guilty is is that a fair assessment of peter it is. I mean, that definitely sums up the last, you know, the, the majority of my time. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about this and we'll, we'll get into like the background of it, but the oddball in there, I think is like the hairstylist, right? Cause it's not necessarily attached with surfing and triathletes and like wrenches working on like old motors. You know, on the surface it's not. And I think it, you know, and I'm sure, you know, we'll get deep into that story of how it started, but I think, uh, in the beginning it came off that way to me as well. I think I was just as surprised to find myself going down that path as other people were, uh, when you pick it apart and you start looking at why would somebody enjoy doing hair? There's so many parallels to be drawn, uh, you know, between, that and what I had always known myself to love doing, you know, there's much more similarities between, you know, working on your motorcycle and doing hair than there are between working on your motorcycle and sitting in an office, banging out emails all day, mm-hmm. you know? So when it, when it comes time to find a job that has those elements of what you love to do, yeah, uh, I'm not, su- I'm surprised more people haven't, keyed into that the way that i was lucky enough to fall into it well let's dive into it so you were in the music industry right you know i worked like odd jobs through high school like everybody like construction and day labor helping helping guys out from the beach who were contractors and they'd bring me in you know to rip out some tile in the bathroom or whatever uh you know i worked at the christmas tree lot every winter but like i got a little taste of a few different things um One of them was installing car stereos, this little car audio shop in Santa Monica. It was a big thing. We're talking like early 2000s. So I get like some wiring, electronics experience. Uh, I'm in community college. I like move in with my girlfriend and I like max out a credit card to buy a flat screen TV. Like, I think they were like 1400 bucks at the time. It was like this big. Um, I paid it off over the next like four years but I wanted to hang it on the wall. And so I had this little like wiring experience, little construction experience. Eventually I get the TV on the wall, like three trips to Home Depot, took me like nine hours. But in the end I was like really accomplished. And I started thinking, well, I could do that again and I could charge somebody to do that. And long story short, I I started a small company, like putting ads on Craigslist and stuff like that, hanging flat screen TVs. But I was always looking for like, all right, what's next? Like, how can I grow this? Uh, so like full circle, that same best friend who I grew up with playing guitar, 
uh, around the time I started that, he started interning in the music industry at a record label here in Los Angeles. Um, you know, and he's just like born to be creative in the music world. So he accelerates rapidly and his life is looking like really good. And mine is looking like I spend most of my time, like under people's houses and crawl spaces or like fighting spiders in their attic. And I want to do what you're doing. So I end up landing a like full-time position, uh, working in artist management. Um, at this point I've like signed a contract. I'm like an employee. I've let the home theater company go, uh, looking back, not by design. It was like at the perfect time that industry was just starting to change a lot. Um, I got out at a good time and I get into what I thought was like where I wanted to be artist management, hip hop, up and coming pop artists, like cool, fun, sexy work. Like you get to like drop celebrity names and like go to events and you're like, going to a concert and writing off the drinks you have on your expense report. I was like, this is it. Like, this is what I've always wanted. And, uh, I realized really quickly I was wrong. You know, it wasn't the best company that I was with the guy I was working for, you know, turned out like a lot of things in LA to be kind of smoke and mirrors. When you take away the like sexy part of it and the cool people and the names and the events, like, the core of your job is sitting at a desk and writing emails and answering phone calls and making somebody else look good and not getting the credit for it and spending your time in an office, which that was my first time in an office, yeah. you know, and, and it, it affected me quicker and stronger than I thought. I, I started dreading going in. I started then for the first time identifying kind of draw this back to the beginning started identifying like what I wasn't getting out of my job, which then showed me what it is that I need to get out of a job. Um, you know, I, I was appreciative that I wasn't like crawling through an attic anymore in like the, you know, San Fernando Valley in the summer, but I missed that. I wasn't working with my hands. And after about a year and a half, he let me go. Okay. Completely blindsided. I like, it was wild to me. I thought I was doing a great job. He didn't know he was like, you know, mixed up what email chain he was on. And he like shot an email to somebody like, Hey, let me know if you know of anybody else I'm looking to get rid of Pete. Uh, and I read the email and I walked into his office and I was like, Hey man, is there something we have to talk about? And, uh, and he let me go on the spot. I left, I left work that day. It was my last day of work in the music industry kind of with a plan and already in my head of like, who am I going to hit up? What label? Who's going to like, I got to get something in before he starts talking to people. And by the time I got home, I, I remember I got home before my now wife then girlfriend just kind of sat quietly in the living room. She got home and I told her what happened and she said, what are you going to do? And I just was like, I think I'm going to do something completely different, but I can't go back to that. Um, and I started looking at, at the time it was barber college. I thought I had to be a barber. Didn't really know much about the beauty world at all. Um, I had a close friend who was a hairstylist and I had like had different barbers and hairstylists who I saw, you know, over the years. And I, I always, I think the first thing I identified with in this industry, the first thing that like caught my attention was people talked about really liking it. Mm. You know, I, I had a barber who like learned to cut hair in the Navy and then had a really successful career in fashion and made a ton of money. And when his company got sold, he like went back to cutting hair like two days a week because that's what he loved to do. And he wanted to stay busy. And he's like telling me this while he's cutting my hair. And I was like, wait, like this dude designed the first Ed Hardy trucker hat. Oh, wow. And, and he's cutting my hair. And I was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back to work after I got my Ed Hardy check. Like, You'd never see me again. It sounds like your first few examples of or connections with 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 barbers or hairstylists were kind of like rad dudes, you know, like absolutely bikers and Ed Hardy guys and Navy guys. And it wasn't the stereotypical introduction to, you know, a, a Paul Mitchell kind of stuff, you know? Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably like a, a 
a side effect of being in Los Angeles is like, there's always something new and cutting edge. And like yeah. that, that first guy who like really got my, my wheels turning was, you know, this like new barbershop opened up in Los Angeles and it was the first of what became a really common thing. But this was like 2010, you know, the first like gentleman's barbershop, like come on in, have a bourbon. Here's a beer. Like, you know, it's not a hair salon. It's a men's, men's grooming barber shop, you know? Yeah. Um, hang what's that? Hang. Yeah, exactly. And it was like, oh, I want to, like, I lived, I lived 30 minutes away. This place was in like West Hollywood. I lived in Venice. I drove there to get my hair cut. Uh, and then I found this, this newer, you know, barber shop popped up and this guy, Luke's just got cool stories. You know, he looks like me. We like the same stuff. And I'm like, I, I can talk to this guy and you know, he's cutting my hair for an hour and we got, we can, we got shit to rap about. Yeah. Um, and so then Luke, you, Luke comes back around full circle in this story in a really weird way later on. So how did that, how did you parlay those experiences into getting into a salon working? So yeah, lose that job, start looking at barber colleges and I'm like, all right. And like I toured one of them. It was in downtown LA. It's like the, the go-to one's called LA Barber College. It's very affordable. You're like, it's like the equivalent of, excuse me, feels like a, like a government run facility. It's not, but it like, it's your public school. Um, you know, like the clients you're doing are like homeless guys who walked in off the street. It's like kind of dirty. You want to get in and out quick. I toured there and I was like, okay. And then I'm like at home up late just kind of like playing with numbers and I was like best case scenario I rise to the very top of the barber world and I can charge this much still didn't feel like enough um so I reached out to my my close friend at the time who was the the longtime hairstylist then his name's Sasha and I said you know what what would you think of me going to beauty school instead of barber school it's like one in the morning we're texting back he's always up late and uh, he wrote back, he was like, you will probably hate every single minute of beauty school and it will be the best decision you ever made in your life. So I was like, all right, I'm going to go tour a beauty school tomorrow. And I went and I toured a beauty school and it was a lot of money. I think Barber College was like 2,400 bucks and took like eight or nine months. Uh, beauty school, the one I looked at was $20,000. You know, if it if it pays off, it'll be worth it. And so signed up, spent the money, committed the next 11 months to a full-time cosmetology school. And I mean, at that point, I had never cut anybody's hair in my life besides my own. Never really done a woman's hair, never never held any of the tools I was going to be using every day. But I just was like, well, if Sasha can do it, I can do it. And you know, there's a few other guys here who they seem to be figuring out okay, like I've faked everything else so far. I'll, I'll fake this until I make it. Day three, they gave us the scissors. And they're like, we're going to do a one length haircut. And we're on the doll heads. And every other person in the class was like shaking. They were timid. They were like nervous. What if I cut it too short? Like, am I holding the scissors right? And I just felt like, this is like everything else I've ever done. And like, what if I cut it too short? Fuck this doll head. I paid 20 grand to be here. Like, I'm, I'm just going to try it. What's the worst that happens? I get another doll head, like a hundred bucks. Uh, and, and it was like day three, I'm doing this haircut on a doll head. And I was like, this is my place. Never been more sure of it. I just did the worst haircut anybody's ever seen on an inanimate object. What should take somebody 30 minutes took me four hours. And I'm like, this is where I'm supposed to be. And I was just from that moment on, like all in head first, couldn't get enough of it. All right. So let's talk about BYLR. I've been in BYLR since 2018. It's Jesse Itzler's Build Your Life resume course. And they are a sponsor of this podcast. So specifically, 30 Days of Excellence. It's every Wednesday night. And it is a life coaching session that happens online. Jesse's on them. Chad Wright, former Navy SEAL and endurance athlete. 
Mark Brown, former NFL athlete and celebrity trainer. And they have everyone on there from like Wim Hof, Sanjay Gupta, Jim Quick. Um, it's amazing. So right now, it's you get your first month 50% off if you use the code WAVES at checkout at BYLR.com. Just go to 30 Days of Excellence, fill out the form, put in the code, and you get 50% off your first month. All right, back to the interview. What do you think it is about cutting hair that you're connected to? Is it starting? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to lead you with that. Go ahead. You know, I think there's there's a few things that like I instantly really like I instantly identified in myself that I could connect to attributes of that industry that were going to work well. And I was like, all right, I already know that I missed working with my hands, and so now. I'm entering into a, a industry where I'm cutting hair. I sit in one spot and people come to me and every hour some somebody new comes in. My scenery changes, my work changes, my project changes, the conversation changes. And if I find you really boring or uninteresting or we don't connect and I got to like dig deep to find the attention span to get through this, I know you're gone at the top of the hour and my next one's coming in. Yeah. And I just love that. Like it's constantly changing. I could do, you know, a different haircut nine times a day over nine hours. And you, it, it's not the same as what you did just before it. Yeah. I get it. I was, um, years ago I was walking into our TV room and my wife was watching some Bravo. I think it was Bravo. Um, blowout i think it was called with jonathan anton i know of it i never it was a little before my time and here okay. i ever caught it i watched yeah. and sat down I'm like what is that because it was like this dude with like slick back hair and tattoos yeah. i'm like what is this <laughs> and she's like oh he cuts hair i'm like all right i'll sit down and there's i i get what you're saying because i'm not a i, I don't do hair I, I never had the urge to to do that but i get the art of it i'm very big on like create you know starting from nothing or like a blank canvas and you know i can i can see how like a, a the hair coming in is a blank canvas and then when you walk out it looks complete i i mean ideally different ideally you know, yeah sometimes completely different depending on what they you know obviously want you to do but i i loved that show and just the i don't know why it's just like i get it i was kind of drawn to that show every once in a while we'll turn it back on it's been years but yeah. just that kind of like motorcycle dude you know cutting hair and the, like the art of it was awesome to me but how did you get over to chris mcmillan's then that you know i've told the story so many times and i've never really like i've never figured out how to describe it uh the universe, luck, chance, uh, divine intervention, all of the above. I'd heard the name Chris McMillan. I think he's kind of, it's tough to remember back before I knew him and did hair, but like, I think he might be like one of the only, only hairstylists that like transcends out of the beauty industry and is a little bit of a household name. Like people who don't know anything about hair or beauty might've heard his name because of his Jennifer Aniston ties and like he's made some appearances. Um, so I'd heard the name, but like, I didn't know anything other than like, yeah, like that guy, he's got a salon and he, he did the Rachel. Um, and then like, I, you know, start following some people who work at his salon and it's on Instagram uh, on Instagram. And I'm like, what time frame is this? Uh, 2014. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, there's a couple guys there, uh, you know, a friend of mine now, Dominic Cerna. I'm like, Dom, he'd been there a long time. I'm like, that looks like somebody I would hang out with. And then this guy, Jason Schneidman, pops up on there. And I was like, that guy is like doing everything I want to do. Like he, he's, he's known as the men's groomer. He's branded himself. He just does men's hair. And it's like, you know, every, every like hot shot male celebrity, like Jason's cutting their hair. He's like riding motorcycles and surfing and kind of looks like me and like i was like super into what he's doing so to get by during beauty school going back to like i was always trying to find my way i was always hustling something and i was always using my hands 
uh, I was flipping a lot of motorcycles. I would buy old Harleys out of state, sight unseen, have them shipped here, polish them up, change some parts out and sell them locally. And, you know, make a couple thousand bucks if I'm lucky here and there. But it was like, kept me busy, uh, kept some money in my pocket. And like, occasionally there'd be like a few parts I'd get to steal for one of my own bikes. So I have this old Harley FXR for sale on Craigslist. Uh, I'm like halfway through beauty school and I get a phone call late one night on a weeknight, like 10 30 at night. And this guy's like, Hey, what's up? I, you know, I live real close to you. Um, let me come look at it right now. And I was like, Oh, it's kind of late. And I was like, all right, like, yeah, come on by. Um, you know, give him my address. I was like, go down the alleyway. My garage is in the back. It'll be open. So I go in the back and I'm sitting there and, uh, Jason Schneidman pulls up in his truck. And right away, I'm like, oh, that's that's the men's groomer on Instagram. I follow this dude. He works at Chris McMillan. I'm in my head. I'm like, that's wild. That's crazy. I didn't know he lived near here. And he comes in, and we talk, and he's looking at the bike. Did you, and, you like, I know who you are kind of deal, or did you play it Not cool? yet. I'm like trying to play it cool because I'm like, I want him to know that I know who he is, but I also really need him to buy this bike because yeah. I need some money. And uh, day one of beauty school, they asked us to bring a vision board, and I never made a vision board before. And I made one and I like went to Kinko's and bought a glue stick and put it all together and like showed up like a little kid on day one of school. Like keep in mind, I'm 25 years old. Everybody else is 18. I was the only one with a vision board on day one. They told us during orientation to bring it, it was weeks earlier. Everybody else is like, oh, I forgot. And the teachers are like, yeah, like whatever. Cool. Like we don't care about that. But like I had my vision board. And so I was like, oh, I showed everybody. And then I took it home and I taped it on the wall in my garage. And it's like pictures of hair and haircuts and things that I find interesting and beautiful. Uh, and now, you know, six months later, I'm standing in the garage with the men's groomer and he sees the vision board on the wall. The vision board, yeah. And he was like, what's up? What's that? And I was like, well, actually, man, I'm, I'm in beauty school. And like, I know who you are. I follow you on Instagram. And like, I think everything you do is really dope. Like, I love your work. And we talk about, you know, hair for a minute. And he's like, super cool. And I remember I wanted 8,000 bucks for the bike. And he's like a real fast talker, mover, shaker, hustler. And he was like, all right, check it out, bro. I can't give you eight grand for the bike. I'm going to give you five. And I was like, yeah, that's never going to happen, man. Like, not a chance. Like, not even close. And he was like, all right, cool. Well, we'll talk. And he like, you know, gets ready to leave. And then as he gets into his truck and he's leaving, he was like, but hey, you got my number. Hit me up and come to the salon sometime. And I was just like, fucking game on. Like, that's all I needed. You gave me that, like, little inch. And uh, how long did you I just wait? started next day. Next day. Next day. Blowing him up. So texting you him. you for that, like, stereotypical Wednesday call. Wait a couple days. No. No. I've, I know the rules. I've seen swingers. <laughs> but I was like, we're not. I'm not trying to date this guy. I want to get married right now. Like me and you tomorrow. Uh, here. Yeah, I'm here and you're here and I'm not letting you get away. Start blowing him up. You know, hey, well, tomorrow a good time for me to come in and, you know, oh, on set tomorrow. Cutting Chris Hemsworth hair tomorrow. I'm this and that, you know, I'm, I didn't stop. And uh, finally one day, I'm sure he was probably just like, dude, this kid's not going away. And he was like, yeah, yeah, come in tomorrow, hang out. So ditch school Friday. He was like, I start at nine. I'm there at 830. And I have no idea what, I, what we're doing. I think I'm just like, you know, getting a tour of the place. And uh, it's like a Friday. The salon's jumping. Everybody's busy. Chris is there. Every station's full. And Jason brings me in, you know, and he walks me around. He introduces me to people. Chris, this is Pete. Hey, hey, you know. And he was like, yeah, he's going to shadow me today. And I guess that was a pretty common thing because everybody was like, cool, right on. And I stood there in his station and just watched him cut hair all day long. You know, and he probably had like eight or nine clients that day, uh, you know, and I just watched him cut hair. I watched him talk to his clients, the way he interacted with them. Uh, I watched him meet new clients, you know, who had never, never been there before. And the way he like just welcomed them in and put them at ease. I watched him cut clients who he's been doing for 15 years. Um, at the end of the day, he gave me a haircut and it was just like, like fucking cloud nine left, got in the car, called my buddy from beauty schools. Like you'll never fucking guess where I was today. 
uh, filled him in on it. And then I was like, you know, that was incredible. Now what? Like, how do I, how do I keep this going? How do I maintain this relationship? And so I just keep, you know, every now and then checking in, I hit him up. I would like make shit up to call him. I'd be like, Hey, you know, I'm thinking about buying a new blow dryer. What, what kind of blow dryer do you use? And he's like, fucking this kind. I got to run. Um, and I was like, all right, I'm not getting anywhere. I got to get more aggressive. So I just start hitting him up. I'm like, Hey dude, can we go to coffee? I have, I got to talk to you. I need your advice. Let me take you to coffee. That's me for coffee. And he's a busy guy. So he's like, you know, blowing me off tomorrow. Shit. Something came up next day. And then one day he was like, yo, 6 AM tomorrow. Groundworks on Rose. Ride your motorcycle. And I was like, cool. So I'm like, we're going to like get coffee, go for a motorcycle ride. Like this is it. We're going to be fucking tight after this. At like 6 a.m. I meet him, we get in coffee and I just lay it out. I was like, look, dude, I graduate beauty school in four months. I don't want to work anywhere except for the salon you work at. What do I do? How do I do it? You know, and he's like, well, you got to assist first, you know, and he'll hate that I said this part, but he was like, I only cut men's hair. So my assistant has to be a hot chick. So I can't hire you. <laughs> and I was like, all right, like that makes sense. And I was like, what if I like worked at the front desk? What if I tried to get a job as the receptionist? Do you think that's a good move? And he was like, yeah, that could work. And like right there on the spot, he calls up the manager. His name's Damien. You know, and he's like, hey, I'm here with my buddy. You know, good kid. Graduates beauty school soon. I should mention Jason had been at Chris McMillan at this point for like 15 years. He's like, you know, OG, like number three employee there. Okay. He's like, great kid. Finishes school soon needs a job at the front desk. You got it. You got to give him a shot. Damien's like, all right, tell him to come in on Monday and hangs up the phone. He's like, cool. You're going to go in on Monday and meet Damien. And I'm like, holy shit. I got a job interview. I have a job interview with Chris McMillan salon. Uh, we finished our coffee. And he's like, cool. I got to split later. It's like six 15. He leaves and goes to work or something. I'm like, all right, I don't know why you told me to bring my bike, but I guess I'm going home. Like, but I got a job interview. I thought we were going up to Neptune's on one. Yeah, right. I'm like, whatever. I got a job interview. Like, I'll I'll take it from there. Um, I show up on Monday at the salon. I think I put a button down shirt on. Like, I hadn't done that in forever, and like, look like a fucking dork. And I got like my resume printed on like nice cardstock. Has like nothing to do with receptioning or hair. Please tell um, me you take your vision board in. I did not bring my, okay, good. That was a good <laughs> no, the vision board was at that point and still is hanging in the garage. Awesome. Um, oh yeah. I wouldn't get rid of that. And I walk in and I'm like, Hey, I'm supposed to meet Damien and Damien like, Oh yeah, that's me. And he like takes my, my, uh, my resume. And like, I know who he is from like, you know, dig around on Instagram. He's like best friends with Chris manager of the salon. Like this is the doorman. Like you gotta, get, if you're not in with him, you're not in. And he like takes my resume and like just writes across it the whole thing. Pete, friends with Jason, like uses it as a notepad. And he's like, all right, so check it out. You get 11 bucks an hour and you get to work on Mondays. And I was like, okay, yeah. Like that was the interview. Like Jason says, you got to give him a job. And that I guess is enough to get me one shift a week. And so I'm like, boom, I'm, I'm receptionist at Chris McMillan salon. Time goes by, graduate. You have to go take your, your state board test, your license test. And I do, I pass it on my first try, not what I was expecting. And I go into work the next day after getting my license uh, to work at the front desk. And I walk in, and it's like, a, I think it was a Saturday. So it's busy. Everybody's there. And Chris is there. And at this point, Chris and I had just, you know, exchanged a couple brief casual conversations. I'm the receptionist and it's his salon and he's not there that much, but you know, he knows who I am. He always has super nice guy. How are you doing? What's up? You know, but we never like chatted that much. Um, I walk in to go to the front desk. My buddy Dom is there and he's like, Hey man, congrats. I was like, Oh, thank you. Somebody else walked by and like, yeah, Hey, congratulations. And I was like, thanks. Duh front desk is right next to Chris's station. Chris's station is front center. He hears and sees everything. And he goes, congrats on what? And I'm at the front. So now at this point he's yelling, which is actually 
talking for him. Chris is the loudest voice in America. So projecting across the salon, congratulations for what? And I said, oh, I got my, I got my license yesterday. He says, your license for what? <laughs> I said, oh, for, for cosmetology, for doing hair. And he goes, oh, I didn't know you did hair. And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, okay. What well, do you want to be my new assistant? Just like that. Like that. And I said, yes. And uh, I was just like in shock at the time. And he looked at his current assistant, who was my now friend, Stacy. Uh, and he was like, Stacy, what's up? What do you think? You ready to go on your own soon? You know, they'd been together for a few years and it's like the natural progression. And she was like, yeah, more or less. And that was that. I went up to Chris at the end of the day. I like caught him in the kitchen and I was like, hey, like, were you, uh, were you like, were you serious about what you said? And he was like, yeah, that's pinky promise. And uh, we did pinky promise. You know, we both take that shit pretty serious. Sure. And he was like, I can't give you a timeline. Got to make sure Stacy's happy and comfortable, but we'll make it happen. See, I, I would argue you made mention that nothing was working out for you. I would, I would argue that it wasn't working out on purpose to free yourself up because if, if the, if the uh, TV installation gig worked out, you wouldn't have gotten the rate, the, you know, the, uh, the management job, uh, music. Absolutely. Job. And then if that didn't work out and if you didn't have that experience with that dude, this, you would not have been available for those things that would have brought you to Chris's. It's that totally was, true. Really yeah. And, and you know, like this was, you know, around that time when everybody was getting very spiritual, you know, especially in Los Angeles and it, you know, there were like workshops on manifestation and all of a sudden the universe was talked about as a noun and, you know, it was like part of everybody's life. Yeah. Um, and it was the first time where I like saw and experienced that, like, yeah, I put it out there. I put it out there a lot and eventually it happened, uh, you know, on paper. I don't know if you can draw the lines to prove that, but I could have been the kid who like sat there and didn't tell anybody where I wanted to work, but I would sit at school and be like, yeah, I'm going to work at Chris McMillan's salon. And people would be like, yeah, all right, good luck with that. Like see you when you're working in the mall. Listen, I hear so many people talking about man, you know, it's, and they just sit back and, and wait for stuff to happen. You actually did something about it. And most people wouldn't have hounded, you know, and, and just, just stayed on it to make sure that you and your destiny and your dreams came true. Like you did that. There's something yeah. for, you know, everything. And then, you know, I'm, I'm, I blow, I'm blown away myself. Like thinking about like how many different worlds had to collide for that yeah. to happen. You know, the guy who told me to go to beauty school, my friend Sasha, I met him because we were riding motorcycles and we would get coffee at the same place and had similar bikes. You know, I, I met, the men's groomer because I was selling a motorcycle. So everybody should get a motorcycle and see where it, <laughs> see where it takes you. Well, so from there you went on to basically travel the world with Chris as his assistant with, you know, celebrity haircuts and, and, and everything you got to see the world with Chris. It was a, a master class every yeah. day in our industry. Yeah. And doing things that like, honestly, I didn't know were part of our industry. You know, I mean, it was like six months, three, six months after starting work with Chris, like I'm in Africa doing hair. Like I didn't know that was a thing, yeah. you know, uh, you know, Chris is the most diversified hairdresser. I think there's ever been. Um, so let me ask you this. <clears throat> you spent a lot of time watching Chris work. And like technique and the nuances of, of his mm -hmm. technique. How were you able, not that you were copying him, but how did you, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming, you know, how did you try that stuff out? How did it go from watching someone do those techniques and then practicing it? You know, it's interesting. I have, I've talked about this a bit with some folks before because Chris is one of those very few people who is doing exactly what he was born to do. Like there's so much natural ability coming out of him that it makes him arguably a really difficult person to learn from. 
And the example I always use, which will make sense to you, is like if Jimi Hendrix or Eric Clapton sat in front of you just ripping guitar solos for eight hours a day, you wouldn't really learn a thing just by watching because they do it so instinctively and you weren't born with that. And I wasn't born with that. Um, the, The advantage that I had, I think, was being so fresh out of beauty school. You know, and in beauty school is where you really get fundamentals in technique. And although they might not be the technique you go to work with, if you're paying attention and you're dissecting it and breaking it down, you learn the cause and effect of everything you're doing. So whereas Chris doesn't have to think at all about what he's doing and and how he's getting the result he's getting, being so fresh out of beauty school and being so technique and and fundamentally minded at that point Mm -hmm. i can watch him enough and get tidbits here and there of oh that happened because he did this he got this result because he did that so when did you go when did you go on your own it's kind of always part of it you know like uh, a good assistant is doing hair constantly in their own on their own time so you know I'm I'm in the salon working for Chris, uh, but after work, like if me and my buddy are going to dinner, like I'm most likely giving him a haircut before we go. And then over time, the the salon, Damien, our manager, and Chris, they they have, they, they want everybody to have a chance to to do it. So, the longer, the further you get into your apprenticeship, mm-hmm. um, you know, all of a sudden it's like, hey, Damien, I got this chick hit me up on Instagram. Like she really wants a haircut. Like, can I bring her in at six at the end of Chris's day? And you know, yeah, that'd be fine. And now you're like, now it's showtime because now you're doing hair that other people are going to see. And I remember like my first day where I got to bring in some clients. Um, I remember like having such anxiety the night before that I was praying every one of those clients would cancel. And I wouldn't have to do them in front of other people. You know, I think I did three, three clients my first day, you know, and it was like, it's going to take me two hours per person. And, you know, at least, and, and I remember walking into the salon and every other time I walked into the salon, it was to answer phones or shampoo Chris's clients. And now I'm walking in the salon with my scissors. And it was like, I don't, I don't know if I can recall a time I've ever been that nervous. How'd that but, go? went fine you know you you get through it you don't think it's fine but like your clients are stoked mostly you hope um you know nobody's everybody's super supportive nobody is looking as closely as you think they're looking you know but you get through it and you're just riding this high all of a sudden of like oh i just took clients what is your thing like every hairstylist has a thing what is yours? Do you have a thing? You know, I don't have like a, I don't have like my trademark thing. I think what I gravitate towards and I think what most of my clients come to me for is uh, really simple. What I just refer to as kind of like real life hair, everyday hair, like low maintenance, kind of representative of where and how I grew up. Like I will always love and have a place for women with long beachy natural hair. And I do a ton of that. Okay. Um, here's the million dollar question. Are mullets ever going to come back? Mullets are in right now. I I love it. There's, there's like a, there's a trendy fashionable mullet that's going on right now. I guess Uh, Miley Cyrus has a mullet right now. Miley Cyrus has a mullet right now. You know, I can't say I do a ton of those mullets because I don't love a ton of those mullets, (laughs) but that goes right back to, you know, I, love the art of hair and I always appreciate the current trend and it's always something different. Like the mullet just replaced the shag. And before the shag, it was like the really short architectural Bob. And I love all of those and I love their time and their moment. Uh, being in a Southern California salon, I don't think long hair is ever going to be out of style. Like we always have a place for a girl that looks like a mermaid. Um, and so I think my, my, I attracted that clientele as well. When I probably talked people out of some mullets. <laughs> I always 
called it soccer hair, so I wasn't labeled with the mullet <laughs> growing up. What are you going to do? Yeah. I don't have the hair in the back now to actually pull off a mullet, even if I wanted to. So that's Consider my yourself lucky. That's my plight in the world. Um, when did you feel like you made it? Oh, you feel like that, and then you feel like, I mean, you falsely feel like that multiple times. Yeah. I left beauty school thinking I was the shit. I mean, like, people liked my haircuts in beauty school. You know, they were paying 11 bucks, and it was like a serious roll of the dice. So, like, it wasn't a hard crowd to please. But, like, I left beauty school with clients who wanted to follow me. These were, you know, mostly Looney Tunes who were, like, you know, didn't have anything else to do with their day. And I had a job as the, like, the receptionist at Chris McMillan Salon. I was in my head. I was like, this is it, bro. Like, you know, you made it. Yeah. You could do any haircut in the world. I remember even talking with with my friend Dom, who's a, an incredible hairstylist and still at the salon. And I was super early on. And I was like, yeah, dude, I feel good. Like, I feel confident. Like, I'm pretty sure I could do any haircut that somebody walked through the door and requested. And he just started fucking laughing and called me out so hard and was like, not a fucking chance. Uh, and you, that you, you realize he's right really quickly. Yeah. You know, I thought I was the shit in beauty school because I was surrounded by people who were very timid and also just starting out their, their art. You watch Chris McMillan work for one day and you're like, oh, I don't know shit. Well, in your defense, you were the only per- person that brought in the vision board the first day. I, I did. But you had a leg up I on was. everybody. I had a leg up on everybody. They could braid hair better and faster, but they didn't, they didn't have vision boards. And that might be the pivotal moment. All right. Let's talk about britches real quick. I love britches. This is a britches. Oh, sorry. This is a Britches Warthog. So what is Britches? Britches is an iconic clothing brand that was founded in, in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. One of the coolest shopping areas in the world. And I like to think it's a clothing brand that mixes like prep and surfer and like punk rock all mixed up in one. They are the ones that brought the rugby as we know it to America. And they've also developed that guy, the iconic Warthog logo. So right now... Listeners and viewers of Making Waves podcast can get 10% off their entire order at warthog.vip. So just go to Warthog VIP, order whatever you want. It's all cool stuff. And type in code WAVES, W-A-V-E-S, at checkout, you get 10% off. It's awesome. Again, I've been using this brand since I was a little kid. They went away for 20 years, and our former podcast guest, Matt Carson, brought it back. If you want to look cool out there, like this guy, see what I did there? Go to warthog.vip, check him out, and uh, get 10% off. How easy could it be? All right, let's go back to the interview. I'm always interested in how those that are making waves in their lives have utilized the media to further their career. How did you use social media when you were able to get your own clients? That was, it was tough. That was, uh, and still it's like remains a challenge for me. I have this like kind of jumbled view on it because I, I work in a salon that is like at the top of that social media game. Like everybody follows Chris McMillan salon and a lot of the hairdressers there, but I work for Chris who's at that time, like 50 years old doesn't really engage and interact with social media, doesn't need to. Everybody knows who he is. You know, Chris is like, look, I I built my career without Instagram. And I was like, yeah, but like, I don't have Jennifer Aniston to do for the fucking pilot of Friends. Like, it's a lot different then. I need Instagram. And uh, I'm watching people in my salon just skyrocketing. And brand deals are coming through and they're getting paid to post stuff. And I was like, I don't, I'm like light years away from that. Yeah. But we were talking about, you know, what's your thing as it relates to hair and, you know, you've developed, even if it doesn't jump out to you, you've developed a thing probably, you know, a a style. I mean, you certainly have one, but I would, I would say looking at your Instagram feed, you have a, a voice, a visual voice on Instagram, you know? 
Yeah, I think, you know, now I try to do a, a little more lifestyle, a little more, a little less hair. You know, in the beginning, you're pumping out a ton of hair photos. Everybody you follow is a hairstylist doing the same. And at a certain point, you get sick of seeing haircuts. For me, going all the way back to when I was going to that barber shop pre-hair, it was like, I liked the time I spent with that, that guy, Luke, who was cutting my hair. I liked hearing his stories. And I was starting to see in the salon now that like, that's a really big part of it. You can give somebody a really, here's the thing. Most people don't know the difference between a good haircut and a great haircut. They'll walk around with a good haircut uh, and their best friend has a great haircut and nobody sees the difference. A hairstylist sees the difference and knows the difference. That shit's for us. So when it comes to the client, you know, delivering an incredible haircut is only going to get you halfway there. And I was seeing that. I was like, oh, there's people who I know who are technically, by definition, incredible hairstylists. They're not that busy because they're kind of boring and nobody wants to hang out with them. And the other side of that was like, I see people who are slinging very mediocre haircuts, nothing special, and they're fucking booked. They're like, day is packed. And they're like this lively personality. And everybody talks about how much fun it is to be around them. And clients are going to remember that. If you gave them an incredible haircut and they spent an awkward hour sitting quietly in your chair, they're probably not coming back to you. You know? Well, what's and, is I don't think you even I don't I don't think you noticed or picked up on this what you said. When you were looking at their social media, you're like, oh, I think I could hang out with that guy. And I think I can hang out with that guy. When I don't want to call it a pivot, but when you pivoted for, for lack of a better term, from hair to more lifestyle. I think maybe even I, I I think that conveyed to your customers now of oh, I can hang out with Pete. I think so. I hope so. You know, because I mean, as long as you can scroll through my page and like pick out a couple haircuts where you're like that that looks pretty, I'd like to have yeah. that. Um, you know, I hope that's enough to entice somebody to come in. But also, like I'm always like blown away and 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 have like. Uh, relieved when somebody or happy when somebody comes in and they're like hey by the way like i saw you're into porsches like i'm really into Porsche, and that's like cool like now we get to talk about old porsches for an hour while i cut oh, your hair oh, so we haven't even crossed that we haven't even touched oh that yeah that, um, that, right. that stuff runs deep there is a quote that i love of yours it came from um an interview you did with voyage la okay and it says I have a few thousand followers. I think that's increased by now, um, but like six real friends and I'm stoked on that or I'm stoked. Yeah, I'm stoked on that. Um, don't compare your life to the ones you see on online. They're not real. Yeah. So it, I want to lead into this and you and I um, talked about this prior. I look at my job as a blue collar job, right? You know, it's tools and my tools are the cameras and the lenses and the filters and your tools are the combs and the, the scissors and everything else that goes along with that. And to me, it's just the more, you know, you put in your toolbox and I say blue collar because one day I'm working with celebrities behind, you know, backstage or somewhere else on set. But then other days I'm doing you know, a nonprofit video on the back that there's no food and I can't even find electrical to <laughs> plug in my lights and stuff. <laughs> and it, it brings you down to earth, you know? So Absolutely. explain what that's like in your field, you know, and you can even touch on like, what's the difference between like a, you know, a celebrity gig versus like a real quote unquote normal person, you know, where the lights and no one's looking at. I, I have, yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's tough not to make this whole thing always come back to Chris McMillan and what I learned from him, but he just played such a major role in, in who I am professionally. He is the greatest example of that and he preaches it wholeheartedly. And, you know, contrary to, to popular belief, like Chris's day is largely filled with people you've never heard of in the salon who he's been giving haircuts to for 20, 30 years. Um, and that is who his allegiance falls with. And he will, you know, say no to a job with whatever celebrity you can think of because he has 
this woman booked in the salon tomorrow and he's been cutting her hair since he was 20 years old and she drives all the way up from Palm Springs for it. And, you know, he makes sure, you know, he ma- he makes a point to, to get the importance of that across. And it's really easy to lose sight of that because, you know, I start working with him and everything's like luxury and, 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 you know, celebrity and whatnot. And, you know, you're on a private jet and you're in this, you're in Paris and you're this, and he would always, you know, make sure to reiterate we're the hired help. And it doesn't matter, like, it doesn't matter whose jet, what jet, private jet you're on, because it's never yours. You were there to perform a service. And to a degree, you need to always act accordingly. And I'm not saying, you know, it's like this, you know, you're not worthy, don't look me in the eyes kind of thing. But if you stay in that space, I think you maintain gratitude. Um, when you when you start floating out of that space, I think the gravit- the gratitude floats away with you and the entitlement starts to replace it. And honestly, I, I think Chris is probably, in my opinion, the only hairdresser in the world who has earned the right to having an ego, and he holds none. So working directly under him, I was kind of put in the space where it's like, hey, if this guy's not going to walk around like he's the shit, there's definitely no room for you to walk around like you're the shit. Yeah. I think that's cool. Um, I've, I've mentioned this before, and I don't like to repeat things, but um, and from other podcasts, but I'm a big fan of Jesse James in terms yeah. of the cycle building. And yeah. it's, it's not, I don't even like those kind of bikes. I mean, I hate, I actually hate those kind of bikes. No, offense. I hate his bikes too, but I love his work. Right. And yeah. the craftsmanship behind it. I actually really loathe those bikes. I'm more of a Norton kind of old school kind of guy. Love it. But, um, there's something about the craft of it and the nuances we talked before about like new, the nuance of things. And there's, there's nuances to how to change a light bulb. You know, you obviously yeah. you want to turn the electric, you know, so there's nuances in anything, haircutting, bike building, certainly editing, filming, that kind of thing. And I even went so far at one time of trying to get into that blue collar. I'm here to work mentality where I went to like an army surplus store and got a pair of blue Dickies cut the bottoms off, <laughs> threw some vans on and a gray t-shirt. And when I went to edit like big projects, that was my outfit to sit at the studio. Cause I, I love that to get in the headspace of I'm here to work and these yeah. are my tools and this is what I'm here to do. And I found that that was, I mean, so do you have like a, 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 a thing that you do to get into that headspace of the creating behind the scissors? You want to know what my outfit is? I'm not asking what you wear. <laughs> like, I do. Funny enough. I, I am in a it, bit of a uniform. I okay. have like three pairs of pants and my shirt is white or black. Um, mm-hmm. I keep it pretty simple in that sense. Um, you know, as far as like getting myself into that headspace, I, I don't really have like a routine or something to, to bring me there. I think I've, I've seen a little bit of both sides. Like we talked about earlier, the like, business owner, you're working for yourself. There's great times and there's bad times. Uh, and then I had the salary, the gig, you know, where it's like, you got that security. Um, I think I've spent enough time in that first space that that gig worker, independent contractor space that I'm still in that I kind of always live in fear of those slow times. Uh, and that keeps you, keeps me in a space where, you know, I, I don't think I'll ever take for granted the the times where I am able to work. Well, speaking, I, of, I do say no to some work, but how did you get through COVID? COVID was a was a tough one in California. Absolutely, um, I think we had it. I think we had it worse than salons. I should say. I think salons had it worse than any state in the country. We had three separate closures throughout 2020. That if you add up, I worked four months in the salon in 2020. How are you um, looking around that? My fear of never being able to work, uh, has lended well to my like obsessive diligent savings. Um, I, I'm married to a woman who was luckily able to work the entire time. She's the exact opposite of me. 
She works for a major corporation and like a very logistics based job. Uh, and her company kept her working full time the entire time. Um, and you know, as far as just like mentally, I was able to take a lot of comfort in knowing, you know, because how, how lucky I am to work in the salon I work in and have the clients that I have. I, I had a lot of comfort in the thought that like my salon, my clients aren't going to be hugely impacted by this. And to some degree when this is over, cause it will be over, we're going to get to pick up where we left off. Were you able you know, to haircut someplace else? At, at times, the, you know, we had our first closure with everybody else, which was like March to June. Okay. Uh, and I wasn't cutting any hair. I was like, you know, like counting the rice and beans in my pantry along with everybody else. And, you know, just basically staring through the blinds, waiting for the world to end. Uh, we went back to work momentarily in the summertime. That was very brief. Closed down again. Um, like side note, timing wise, this worked out really well for me. I had a real bad back injury right at the beginning of COVID. So that first closure was also like using that time to try to fix it. It ultimately didn't fix itself. I had back surgery in July. So our second closure lined up coincidentally with like right after my surgery. So I used that time to recover and strengthen back up. Um, by the end of the, the summer, we were still closed. I started picking up my house call, house call clientele again, um, which I'm very lucky to have, you know, a, a core group of guys. It's actually mostly men's haircuts where there's not interested in coming to the salon. It's not convenient for them. And I go to their house. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I resumed that, which was really helpful and, you know, keeping bills paid, but it was this like weird time. Like some hairstylists were like very, very public about the fact they were doing house calls. Other stylists were like shaming them for doing that. And you're a little super spreader running house to house, and, you know, in every, in every industry, it was like, everybody had an opinion on what you were doing and if it was right or wrong. So it was kind of like this like secret, Hey, I'll come over and cut your hair. If you don't, you don't think that's weird. Right. Cause if you think that's weird, I think that's weird too. And I would never do that. But if you don't think that's weird, I'll, I'll come and do that. And here's an um, NBA. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I don't, don't no pictures. Don't post that. Uh, and so I was, you know, towards the end of the second half of COVID when, you know, we were starting to learn more about it and we could confidently be around each other with our masks on. It was easier to start taking some more of those house call clients and, and, you know, just kept some money flowing. Um, all right. I got a couple more questions before we wrap up a uh, one finishing up the hair. Well, it, I won't, I won't narrow it down to hair. What has been your favorite failure when you look back at it that led to like one of your biggest successes? I mean, I think it's, you know, an, an easy answer, but it, getting fired from that job, okay. getting fired from that job and putting me in a position where, and you know, it's funny for years after that, when I told that story, I lied and said, I got laid off, you know, this, the story I told you, yeah. And then, and, you know, the company was, wasn't doing well and I got laid off. Uh, and I guess maybe probably the more established I got in what I am doing, that narrative changed, but yeah losing that job and like realizing like that guy was such an asshole that I worked for and he had all the control over me, put me in the position I needed to be in to do something as drastic as enroll in beauty school. Cause looking back, I can't believe I was ever somebody who like took that wild of a chance. Like, I don't think I would make that. I would make that risk assessment now and say, no, thank you. I'll like, just go get a job. Uh, but looking back, I'm so grateful that like at that time, at that age, I was, I was like, you know, confident enough to make that decision. I was 26. I thought it was my, like, I, I remember thinking like, oh yeah, the, this is your last shot. You don't get this one right. Life's over, yeah. which is wild to think. All right. Let's talk Porsches. Favorite Porsche. Uh, Year, model, color. Oh, uh, it's, it's really hard. Cause in my head. There's two categories of Porsches. There's 911 and pre 911, the 356s. Yeah. And I would really love a pre A, which is a 1954, 55, 356. Um, 
but then you're you're what's that gray uh i love ivory okay i had an ivory speedster for a while uh 56 um i love an ivory one but you know then it's like you got this a pre a is 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 also prehistoric and it's like i think at the time they were rated for base horsepower of 38 so it's like just a little bit more than like you know a six-year-old's first motorcycle uh they're like extremely primitive cars and now at this point they're so expensive and valuable you can't really do anything with it you can like drive it and do a loop and come back home you're not like parking it and like i couldn't drive that to work and park it out front uh it's full of irreplaceable parts so then uh 911s i in my opinion porsches are air-cooled rear engine cars only so they ended for me in 96 um i would love a I would love a pre 73 911, like a 68 to 73 911 before they went to the impact bumpers and the, the big flare on the rear fenders. Um, in my mind, that's like old enough to be so cool and just modern enough. I, I could drive that to work. It's got air conditioning and some power steering and like disc brakes. And I can, you know, put my headphones in and take a phone call as opposed to like that earlier car where you're just like, you know, yeah death trap the whole way we're a little different i'm a 1984 sc targa turbo um red great big wheel red on the back yeah it's gotta be big, red. okay well you'll love this i it's not i'm just putting it out there i am working on a 78 911 sc that's hopefully coming my way soon oh first man. first year sc nice not targa there's something about i i don't know what it is that so the backstory to that is, and I still regret this. I am so you. You may not ever talk to me again, or just think I'm a complete knucklehead, <laughs> which I am. Um, I had the opportunity to buy my dream car, that car that I just told you. That car, mm -hmm. I had a six foot poster on my wall as a kid of that car. I mean, like that exact car, baseball glove, brown and leather interior. You know, just love amazing. And uh, it was a friend of mine's friend and it was his college professor that had lived in the middle of pennsylvania like in like amish country mm -hmm. and he had a six car garage and he had eight cars and the wife said get rid of two of them i don't want to see these things out in the in the driveway anymore so one of them was this porsche and i test drove it and i just i i don't know i don't know what my problem was i was just thinking this is going to be my beach car this is what i'm going to take to yeah. the when i go to the beach and i test drove it with flip-flops on and the flip-flops <laughs> are a little big and those pedals are so narrow yeah they're tight they're tight and i was like i can't drive this to the beach it's killing me and I, i'm such an idiot where i said you know what i'll hold, well, hold on <laughs> so i think about this and then he sold it up to me he showed me receipts of twenty five thousand dollars worth of repairs in the last year and he's like i'm like how do you how much do you want for it and he's like I, she's give she's on my neck about this. Give me twelve five, and I'm like, oh I'm god, like twelve five, and I'm and so that car now and th that that era of vehicle now they were going for fifteen, sixteen, seventeen at the time. They're fifty in, now. You can't find one for under fifty yeah. now. Yeah. It breaks my heart. But have you been over to um, Magnus Walker shop at all? I haven't. I follow him, and I love the way he puts a 911 together yeah. and they're subtle um, these subtle things that he does to them subtle things you know amber fog lights and really aggressive low suspension and he's got some really nice cars i like his stuff he's a really really nice dude we oh, i'm we, sure we were at a bistro i had we i was out there for work had my family there and uh, two small kids and we were we were at a bistro downtown and we were going back to venice and I looked, I stopped in the middle of the street. I'm like, this looks familiar. Like this street looks familiar. I don't know why. And I'm like, I think Magnus Walker shop is around here. Cause I just watched his documentary, that little documentary. Uh -huh. Is I'm he like, in Venice? No, he's like in the art district. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. And I'm driving around. I'm like this. He, I know his shop is like right around here. Cause I just feel it. And I looked up. You recognize the brick. And yeah, I'm like, there it is. So I'm like, I, I took, I don't know how old my daughter was at the time, maybe seven. And I'm like, let's go in there. 
and the, the other two stayed in the car and we went in and his like assistant was there and he's like, Hey, what's up? And there's those cars that you see, they're just, they're there. They're just sitting yeah, there lined up. It's like, Oh my gosh, this is amazing. And they couldn't have been nice. I left there. He's like, here, here's a signed book. And here's this. And I'm like, I would love to have him on the podcast. And he's like, Oh yeah, I'm sure he would. He seems to be interested in, in you know, getting it out there. He, that's the thing. A lot of these Porsche guys, uh, they, they play it really close to the chest and it's like yeah. a real elite thing. And you know, I don't want you to know what I have and don't look at my cars. And that's what I love about Magnus is he's like, not only does he, drive them like a lot of people don't but he he puts it out there like try to make this uh you know an accessible thing because it's it's hard to be it's hard to use the word accessible when talking about old porsches because they're they're not you know and he's got such a great story you know selling jeans and badat basically a badat <laughs> yeah sir steven tyler and then he's got this thing now all right so lastly some of your posts or i know one of them had something about cold plunges Yes, so you're the ice in, barrel. Yep, and the Wim Hof stuff. And so I'm in that BYLR BYLR group from with Jesse Itzler. His it's his uh -huh. group, and that's such a thing. The, the the group, you know, thousands and you know, hand I don't know, like five thousand people are in the well in the group. I'm in his calendar club, and they actually sponsor this podcast and their thirty days nice. it's like life coaching Wednesday calls. Um, they're actually they're doing one right now, and um. They are such a believer in that. And Wim Hof walked us through a breathing uh, mm -hmm. class. And then one of his uh, coaches, Trish, here in the States, I think she's out by you. And uh, so what do you get out of the cold plunges? I get a lot out of it. I love it. I, I, I came to it originally uh, when I first got into triathlons, training for that. And it was like I had never worked out that hard in my life. Or like that was also kind of my first intro to like endurance training. Mm -hmm. Um, and admittedly I started training kind of late. So like I needed every day I needed, like, I, I didn't have that recovery time. I needed to fit long workouts in between work days. Cause I had like eight weeks to get ready for my first race. Uh, and so my buddy introduced me to the ice bath, the cold plunge. And he was like, you know, when you finish a workout and you're kind of shaky and you're like, I just know I'm going to have trouble. Like getting out of bed tomorrow uh, i finished my workout with that and like got in the ice bath did a few rounds and woke up the next morning like ready to fucking ride my bike again uh and that blew me away and so i started getting more into it and then you can't get into ice baths without inadvertently getting into the breathing it's yeah i mean if i i've never seen anybody get into one and control their breath and if i did i'd be concerned about who they are yeah um and that breath control, I think, plays such a role in, in your ability to endure long activities like I was training for, as well as your ability to, to recover from injury. Um, a big part of my training had always been hot yoga as well, mm -hmm. which I'd been into yoga for a long time. I switched to hot, you know, four or five years ago. And what I absolutely loved about hot yoga is it was miserable. Like being in that room sucks. And I mean, like 110 degrees, 85 to 90% humidity, and you're working out. So yeah, right away, your fight or flight reaction kicks in. And so now your workouts have taken on a different, uh, a different struggle. Your, your body doesn't want to be there and your mind is telling you, get the fuck out now this is bad yeah. um and so hot yoga got me really comfortable being really miserable and then the ice bath took me right to that same place but from a different direction yeah. like it's not it's not fun i don't like being in the ice water i don't That's find that enjoyable because for me i have a tub at the house it was like a like i went to one of those like tractor supply stores and got like a yeah. like a trough i guess yeah, they're great. Yeah. And the whole BYL, BYLR principle is, you know, do things every day that you don't want to do. And mm -hmm. that ice bath is one of them. Aside from like the medicinal, you know, pr um, things that it does to you. But um, I find Wim Hof's breathing so beneficial for everything. Like if I'm in pain. Everything. Like I'll, I'll give you a funny story last night. I have a 13-year-old lab. We have wood floors everywhere in the house. 
he felt he slipped on the wood floor one on the stairs and he just won't walk up the stairs anymore. So I literally carry a 90 pound chocolate lab up and down the stairs every night and every morning. (laughs) Well, somebody put last night, he needed to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Somebody put a bag on the stairs, which the stairs are usually cleared off. I didn't notice that it was dark. Oh God. I fall off the stairs and I'm just trying to not crush him. <laughs> so I like, you know, I say that it was I wish I had it on video, but I'm laying there in so much pain. And the first thing I think of is, all right, what would Wim Hof do? And I start doing the breathing <laughs> techniques and you just get through it. Tattoos. Wim just- Wim Hof would get a carpet stair runner <laughs> he would. for the old which is what we're going to do because my 13 year old, yeah. this is his, we're, we're in a new house and this is his okay. first time with wood stairs and oh, he go. does not get it. I know. But yeah, that breathing, you know, it, when you try to describe what it does to somebody who's never done it, they just look at you like you're fucking nuts. Yeah, it's like cuckoo. Cause I tell them, like, hey, you know how you breathe in and out and it goes in your lungs and out of your lungs? Well, I can control where it goes. I can send it to the part of my body that needs it the most. And they're like, yeah, okay, like, good, good luck with that. Let me know how that goes. But it's, it's real. It's real. Okay. And that, okay. that, that ice water takes you right there. I had a good friend that his wife um, was pregnant and the doctor, like they were having a major issue with her blood pressure and they wanted to put her on medication, but they're wrestling with that. Cause I don't know if it was a, Anyway, there was having some concerns with the baby. And I called him one day and I'm like, listen, here's the app. Go get the app. He'll walk if th- he'll walk her through the breathing mm-hmm. exercises. And I, I said, I guarantee your blood pressure will drop. And she did that for a week. And the doctor's like, I don't know what happened, but you don't need to worry about this anymore. And she just consistently so did it throughout the pregnancy. Yeah. I mean, it's something that we don't, we don't think about. And it happens so subconsciously yeah. that, uh, of course, there's you know, ways to unlock deeper uses of that. You know, we just never, it never comes across your mind. Why would it? You don't have to think about breathing. Your, your body does it for you. That's why when you start to really think about it, it goes a lot of places. It does. Um, all right. So where can people find you on social media? If they want you know, to uh, a haircut, where can they, where can they get you? If they want to buy a haircut, I'm selling them. I'm a, I'm just an Instagram guy. Uh, okay. I'm just a little too old to, to in, pick up TikTok, and I never got into Twitter. Uh, Instagram at Pete Lambden. Uh, there's a little bio on the Chris McMillan Salon you can check out the Chris McMillan dot com or Chris McMillan Salon dot com. Uh, easiest place to get a hold of me is at Instagram. There's a, a link to our website. You can shoot me a message. I love talking to people. Uh, if you can't tell after this, all I do is talk, but, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reachable. I'm accessible. Uh, I'm bookable. I love to talk. It's all available right there. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was a great, thank you for having me. You've been very generous with your time. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And then you'll have to, uh, next time I'm on all, I'm in LA for work i'll give you a ring and maybe we'll do coffee or a beverage or i would love that and it something. hopefully i'll like pick you up in a 78 911 sc uh, uh, silver it does have the turbo whale tail on the back even though it's not the turbo but yeah. he has both deck lids so i'd be able to switch up depending on my mood i want yeah. to go turbo look or not but fingers crossed that comes my way soon and then we'll drive over to magnus's and take him to lunch yeah exactly we'll just oh, hey we're out front <laughs> so funny all right well thanks a lot man awesome man i really appreciate it all right look forward and to seeing you again thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed this episode as much as i did if you are interested in getting more information about our guest or the podcast go to the show links below it'll tell you everything direct you to where you want to go i appreciate it if you liked and subscribed and left a comment that does great things for us on all the platforms So, as you go along your week, take care and keep making waves.